I've got to be frank to David Vickers. Many, many years ago, I was involved in every establishment of every organization in British Columbia, I think, mentally retarded children and all the rest of them, because you know, it was the early days of communication yeah. and mass radio. And I remember thinking, thank goodness we have a sterilization law. In certain cases at certain times, I'm talking about the disastrous social circumstances, which were much worse 25 years ago, right? Mm -hmm. And yet I have doubts in my mind when I see in the inquest here that this girl had been sterilized without her knowledge and consent. A terrible uh, imposition, a violation, I think, of her self as a person. Remember, too, that at this, the time this was done, there had not been one single assessment done to determine whether, in fact, she was mentally retarded. People saw her as retarded, but nobody had any, done any testing. The first actual testing that was done on this person was June of 1981, and, th and the psychologist who gave evidence at the inquest said, in his opinion, as a result of that testing, she was not retarded. What she was, what she was the victim of was a social and economic system that Perceive, that caused her to be what she was, and we perceived her as being retarded. Now let me get this clear. She must have been about 23 or 22, 1981. Nine, they, June of 81, that's when right. When they finally decided she was not ipso facto retarded. retarded. Exactly. She was a social problem. That's right. Correct? That's right. Well, at what age was she when she was sterilized? 18. 18. 75 or 6, would that be? 75. I thought that law for sterilization was repealed in institutions. In repealed in 1972, the Sterilization Act in British Columbia. Repealed by the uh, NDP government the minute it was elected. Because there was a time when sterilization was done as a matter of rote. As a matter of rote. In woodlands. In woodlands. Yeah, which was damnable. Yes, absolutely. And so in 1972, the institutional sterilization was, re was wiped out by law. The, the act, act was repealed, which doesn't mean that sterilization stopped. Oh, I thought it did. No, I'm convinced it didn't, Jack. And I think that sterilization continued, and the reality is it's, it went undercover. But she was not in an institution. No, she wasn't. She did was in an ordinary hospital, the Stuart Lake General Hospital, and she was going to have her appendix out. And in the opinion of the doctor, uh, she was retarded. He thought she was probably fertile. There's no evidence that he did fertility tests. And he didn't think that she'd make a good mother. Now, on what basis doctors are qualified to make those kinds of decisions? Well, right on I don't the face know. of it, he's not qualified at all to make that decision. <laughs> Any more than I am. Uh, what, who says that I'm going to be a good father? If the mother had come along and said, look, I know that uh, the girl is perhaps being terribly promiscuous, and we don't want any kids, would that have been all right? I, I would say no, absolutely not. My own view is that... It would have been common sense, though, would it not? In no, there are no justification for sterilization of children, except for therapeutic reasons. If she had a cancer uh, of the uterus or something of that sort, you may have to deal with these kinds of problems. But we're talking about children. With them? 18 years old. Well, now... Scandalous. Are there not situations where sometimes it is agreed to and consented to by parents in specific difficult circumstances. There are situations where parents have consented to sterilize their children and it's still going on today. Is that right? It's wrong. It's entirely wrong in my opinion. Are you I, not for basing example, this on any I, religious view? No, not at all. Not at all. I was recently involved in a case in Saskatchewan where the parents had, uh, were in the process of consenting to sterilize a 12-year-old girl. Not because she was promiscuous, not because they were afraid she was going to have children, but for hygienic reasons. Now, you sterilize people in situations like that, not for the sake of the person, but for the sake of the, yourself. In well, other words, pre precisely, we, it's, it's what we do to these people that sometimes is our greatest handicap, how we perceive them, how we treat them, and it's, a, it, it's unbelievable that it would happen in this day and age. If there were a proper course of law involved, due process, is sterilization though sometimes desirable? My own view is that no. uh, for non-therapeutic reasons, it's not desirable. I think that there are, the evidence is quite clear that there are other alternatives. I was reading an article just early this week on a new technique in Texas, for example, where a, a plug, an ordinary uh, plug, has been uh, developed to insert in the fallopian tubes without any surgery, at all, without any uh, incision at all. That can be removed uh, later if, if the possibility comes along that uh, children are, are are wanted. And what, what we found out, Jack, is that if we look hard enough, there are many, many alternatives, and we've always got to seek the least restrictive alternative to the individual. I must do one more short segment with David Vickers after the break. Cut.
you know, times are going to be tougher for the mentally ret retarded as well as everybody else because of the economic climate, David. Yes. Um, well, Fort St. James again, well, let's take that as an example. This woman came back from the institution, which she was inappropriately placed in early this year. The first thing that happened was that a life skills worker was appointed. Now, the life skills worker was working 40 hours a week, and not on her, but on a whole range of clients. Case load. Yes. Uh, the evidence is that when the life skills worker began to work with Bonita, there was a marked improvement. But what happened early, er, early on in the year was her hours were cut down to 18 hours. The life skill worker had to quit. So Bonita lost her life skills worker. Another one was, was appointed, and uh, that person continued to work lesser hours with Bonita until she died. That worker has now lost her job entirely. So a community in with a, a huge caseload in desperate need is now without any life skills worker thanks to restraint. Yeah, who's restraint? Though? Provincial, I know. Federal. I mean, the jurisdiction over the care of Native Indians is still totally confused. This is a life, this is a life skills worker that's not just do, doing uh, life skills work with Native people. It's doing, she was doing life skills work with the community. But so we have no service in the community. It seems to me to be a, a very, very Why bad social planning Why the devil, when you were Deputy that? Attorney General, did you not arrange for provinces to take over the total care of their Indian population with the appropriate contribution to Ottawa? Well, that, again, uh, had nothing to do with my portfolio. But you know what I mean. I know, you know exactly what, I know exactly what you mean. And one of the things, of course, that we, we've, we've developed policies that have destroyed good Native culture. And you, you can see that you know, it's no part of Native culture to sit on the reserve and get drunk. That's a terrible uh, imposition that we as white people have put on them. It's tragic to see what's happened in that little part of our community. I wish I knew how you could. Well, there, I think there are a number of ways. I think we've got to start recognizing that Native people are entitled to their own culture and uh, live their ways according to their ways, not according to our ways. They are, in fact, uh, our first people. Well, and they are we, different, some of them. As far as money is concerned, one gets the feeling that money is there somehow or other. I mean, the likes of Benita. Sure. Let's talk about Benita Let's talk again. about Benita's Let's money. Let's talk about Benita's money. $750,000 approximately to keep the Northern Training Center going out of a regional budget of $900,000. Mm -hmm. A northern tr training center that has about 30 people in it. Mm -hmm. Now, for me, Jack, that is a total distortion on public spending. It's totally inappropriate. It flies in the face of the provincial government's policy to get rid of institutions. There is no question at all that every one of those pe persons in the northern training center could be better served in community. What for, is the Northern for Training less Center? Money. What for is less it? money. What is it? it? The Northern Training Center is a place for where approximately 30 people go and live and are, are, are taught, trained in three specific areas. I mentioned domestic skills, I think woodworking was the other, and I think janitorial skills were the other. Jobs for white men? Well, I, I would think some Native people as well, but uh, th that's what they're taught. And they are people, of course, who need that You're saying you could some take that $750,000 and apply it to skills in the living in the community and do a hell of a lot better. Yes, we know we can, Jack. There's no question about that, that it's demonstrated. Well, you know, the Community uh, Living Board here in Vancouver has demonstrated it time and time again that community le living is better and costs less money. But for some reason or other, this government appears loath to move. I do a little feature in this program, and I'm telling somebody to do it now, called That's a Fair Question. Here's the question I want to answer. I don't think you can answer it. Is it correct that a status Indian, regardless of the sta chronic state of ill health, cannot be admitted to a BC provincially government financed institution for I, chronic care? I don't know the answer to that, but I think it would, uh, uh, frankly, uh, it would be tragic if that's true. Well, let's, I we'll, just, I just we'll get an answer to that as a fair question, because that really bothers me, of all the, apart from the sterilization this mm -hmm. morning, without any consent at yeah. all, it would seem. The mother must have consented. The mother did. The mother's evidence was different than the doctor's. Yeah. The doctor said that he spoke to the mother, uh -huh. and she consented. Her evidence was that the Mountie came out to the, uh, the reserve, gave her a piece of paper, and while she knew what the piece of paper was, there was never any discussion with the doctor. It was here, sign here, we're in a rush, and let's get it done. That kind of evidence. From but the, the Mounties at the same time showed some consideration when they reported the fact that this girl was going to die if somebody didn't look after her. Incredibly them. sensitive constable, and uh, it goes to the top of the class. I, incredibly sensitive uh, coroner who saw uh, the, the failure of, of the social service system in the community to meet this girl's need and raise the issue to begin with. I think that's just great, and uh, they all, in my view, uh, go to the top of the class for that t type of sensitivity. Well, good, you're a good prod to my conscience, David, and thank you very much for being here this morning. Thank you, Jack. Next, Flying Saucers. After the break.
When you indulge in nostalgia, it means you're over the hill and getting old. 20 years ago, I interviewed Dan Fry. And I always remember Dan telling me of his personal experiences in flying saucers. Have you flown lately in flying saucers, Dan? No, sir, I have not. When was it you did? July 4th, 1958. Eight. No, 50. 1950? Right. All right, tell me, go back into your memory and tell me your experience. <laughs> were you the guy who told me that you were in a place somewhere in California? <laughs> And a flying saucer appeared, and a shaft of light mm. came down, shaft of light, and you went up in the shaft of light into this magnificent mm. spacecraft and went around the world in 26 minutes. Uh, not exactly. Uh, you any... tell me the story, Dan. <laughs> I'd love to hear it again. Actually, it wasn't any shaft of light involved. I mean, a sampling device uh, descended to ground at White Sands Proving Grounds, where I was employed at the time. And there was a communication system within it, although no beings of any sort. And uh, there was a conversation which ensued as a result of which I was invited to make a short test hop in the sampling device, which it was. There were no living beings aboard it. A primary purpose of that was to convince me that it was technology that couldn't have been produced anywhere here on Earth, which I was somewhat doubtful of, uh, still even seeing it uh, arrive. Well, this sampling device was a flying saucer. Uh, I never called it that. Many other people have. What did you call it? Uh, an oblate spheroid. An oblate spheroid. <laughs> and you went on a test flight. Yes. How long were you in the oblate spheroid? About 30 minutes. Where did you go in the oblate spheroid? Over the city of New York. Mm -hmm. And you were in yeah, White Sand Proving Ground, New Mexico? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. And tell me what happened. You went... Mm. <laughs> well, not quite that uh, rapidly. It was a rather rapid uh, ascent, a little better than our missiles could do at that time. Uh, not nearly the top speed, however, that they achieve now. I mean, that uh, technology demonstrated there was ahead of our abilities at the time, but is obsolete. Uh, How long did it now. take you to get to New York? It required about 30 minutes for the round trip. And what height were you at above New York? About the, the primary trip was made at an elevation of about 30 miles. The craft descended to 20 miles over the city so that the light pattern would be more visible. And you were alone in this oblate spheroid? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. What messages did you get? From, where were the people who were controlling the, the, the things that were controlling the spheroid? Uh, it was stated that they were some uh, 90 miles above the surface. What uh, did they tell you, Dan? This is worthwhile telling you again. Come on. What was the conversation and in what language? Well, it was in the English language and the, in the American idiom, except for the fact that uh, the construction was not always the way uh, we would have done it. Uh, it was obvious that the uh, language is being used by someone who had never studied an English grammar. Slang words were occasionally interspersed in uh, direct formal conversation. But I mean, anyway, but they were always understandable. An incredible experience. Well, it's incredible, yes, to many people. But that was the only yeah. time. It has been, however, experienced by many people since that time. But well, they never came back to take you up again, did they? No. That's no. a pity, isn't it? Well, uh, once is enough for most people. I mean, uh, after all, it doesn't happen to everyone even once. You know, there are many people out there mm -hmm. who've never had people mm -hmm. like you talking sure. about flying saucers. Sure. And I've interviewed everyone who's oh. been mm -hmm. in a flying saucer yeah. in the years mm -hmm. over the radio. Mm -hmm. But uh, tell me this, mm -hmm. where are these, what are these people who took you up in the oblate spheroid? What mm -hmm. are they, where are they from? You gotta tell me. Well, all right, but these are the questions that are always asked without people realizing there's no way that uh, they could be answered unless they had originated on some planet in our, uh, galaxy. Or in our solar system. Well, not even in our galaxy. I mean, to, for anyone to explain where they were from. For example, if other than our solar system, they would have to come down, spend a year or two in our uh, astronomical society, study our new general star catalog, find out what we call this uh, star system uh, from which their uh, civilization Did, I, mean, I mean, you must have known that there were just little, little, little biological dots that if there were human, uh, some kind of human being. And they undoubtedly originated somewhere. These individuals had never set foot on any planet. I mean, they had been born in, in the spacecraft, as have about 75% of all of the uh, technological beings in this galaxy. 
Well, the, the, I remember once in one of the space shuttle flights, or one of the, a, the astronaut flights, somebody saw something, didn't they? Uh, someone sees something in almost every space flight that becomes controversial afterwards. Yeah. Now, what always bothers me, Dan, is that uh, nobody can ever prove anything. I mean, you can't prove you were well, up in a flying true. saucer. There, there is no such thing as absolute proof of anything. Oh, yes, there is. I can yeah. prove that you're sitting here talking to me right now. I can uh, lean out and there touch is it. A, there is an image going out over the air, but this doesn't prove to people. Uh, it could be a recording made uh, two years ago, as a matter of fact. But if I drop my glasses on the <laughs> table, something happens. Well, makes a noise. It, it makes a noise. Yes, the noise is created. Anyway, Dan, I'm not, I don't want to be unfair to you. There are many mm -hmm. decent people mm -hmm. who are not round the bend who believe yeah. in flying saucers. Mm -hmm. And there are equal number, or perhaps a greater number, who do not. But those who do not are mostly those who haven't studied the subject to a sufficient degree to uh, have an opinion one way or another. It's a faith. The belief in flying saucers is a faith. Well, it's not a demonstrable... Uh, it is... Uh, there are very specific pieces of evidence if one takes the trouble to accumulate them. They have been around as long as the history of mankind uh, has been around. Do you remember, uh, do you remember telling me what powered that uh, flying saucer? I remember, I think you mm. told me that it was powered by mm. magnetism. Now, by a field which is the result of a resonating of a magnetic and electrical field. In other words, it is equivalent to a gravitational field. Dan, I remember talking to another mm. guy before Mm -hmm. who at that mm -hmm. time was claiming success, maybe it was you, mm -hmm. in bringing back original television programs from the 50s, reconstructing mm -hmm. them in space and bringing them back. Did you ever run into him? Mm, I don't believe so, not to my knowledge, nor have I ever uh, claimed any such uh, no. ability or study. Do you remember Monqua? I remember some tapes made by a gentleman uh, of that name, yes. Monqua, San mm -hmm. Luis Obispo. Mm -hmm. I did a radio hookup with a cut yeah. radio station, mm -hmm. and Monqua spoke to us from Mars. Uh, Daniel yeah. Fry is giving three lectures in town. He's the president of Understanding Incorporated, and you were a rocket scientist? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I spent quite a number of years. PhD in, early, in what? In the early in cosmology, to study the cosmos. Was that a recognizable mm. PhD, or did you make uh, it up? No, I didn't make it up. <laughs> I do have a certificate. Oh, no, no I'm, that didn't mean to be insulting. <laughs> Spacecraft and space travel. He's mm -hmm. going to be speaking this week at Kerrisdale Community Center, at Unity of Vancouver and Oak Street, mm -hmm. and the Hermit Society at 2050, 2050 Cypress Street. Mm -hmm. I just wish you'd made a recent trip, Dan. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, it would be nice, although I don't know whether it would add anything to... Uh, sure it would. Knowledge. God, just imagine if you could bring an alien being yeah. in here this morning. It'd be a lot nicer to yeah. interview than some of my political guests. Yeah. Having having uh, spent some now uh, 25 years in the study of the subject brought about by this, <clears throat> I still don't claim to be an expert in it, but uh, I spent a number of hours studying a subject that is sufficient to attain four consecutive doctorates in, in any subject in Dan, the college. Dan, I've got to take a break yeah. now. Mm -hmm. Best of luck for you. I hope your, success, your lectures are a success. Yeah. And I uh, wish me a trip in the flying saucer. Thank After you. After the break. Thank you. 64 years since the end of the First World War at... Uh, on the November the 11th, 1918. 64 years, Angus. That's true. We were pretty young, weren't we? <laughs> we weren't in that one. <laughs> Angus McLean is the treasurer of the Poppy Fund for the Legion in BC or for the Legion For the Vancouver. Vancouver. For the Vancouver Legion. Poppy Fund, yep. How are you doing this year in your sale of poppies? Well, uh, we did very well. Uh, we are up a little, but with the economy, we sure didn't expect uh, to do too much. But uh, we... Um, we only have the one week, as you probably know. We can only um, tag on the streets for two days during the year, even though we have the full year to disperse money. How much? Uh, how much? What do you do with it? How much did you collect? Did you collect, roughly speaking. Oh, 170,000. What do you do with the money, Angus? As if I didn't we know, but tell people. We disperse to the needy veteran and their dependents, roughly 100 and. 
twenty odd thousand dollars? Any veteran who's in trouble can come to you at the Poppy Fund, and if it falls within the category of extra help he needs, you'll do your this best. This is an emergency fund that's only. It. Emergency only. Right. If a guy's on his pension or whatever, that's it. But if he's if he's up against it, but if any he's reason. up against it, and uh, he has a, a a number, we can look after him. Give me a poppy. I'll make a noise. Even though we uh, tag only one week per year, we accept donations year round. Okay, dokie, young. It's best of luck. It's a good cause. In fact, it's the best That's good for cause sure. I know. That's for sure. Right? Yeah. Where am I? Tomorrow. Revelstoke rerun tomorrow. Don't miss it. Best documentary we've done in Webster. Friday morning, Kaplan. Oh, I'll tell you about that later. Revelstoke rerun at 9 a.m. precisely. Watch Scalbenia on Webster on Check at midnight precisely. The Revelstoke Dam in detail with Webster, tomorrow, 9 a.m. precisely. Webster at the Revelstoke Dam, check at midnight. Webster builds a dam at Revelstoke on check at midnight.